So cluster analysis is the topic for tonight. And these are, are things that I feel like a lot of analytics people are aware of and have used before. Uh, but mostly it's k-means. So we're going to do hierarchical cluster analysis to kind of show you maybe one you haven't seen. So I'm going to talk mostly about memory and semanticity as my um, linguistic example and um, get, slowly work us into semantic networks. The section that, so we're going to do categorical data, continuous data, and then we're going to do semantic vector models, which is where we're taking words and turning them into numbers. Uh, this semantic networks idea is going to really be very important for those models. So we're kind of going to lead into the, the um, lectures for later. So this, this lecture will come back, basically. And talk a little bit about semantic feature models. And so mainly just kind of like, what is memory and why should we care? What's that got to do with words? So on the very basic level, um, although I recently saw that they were doing a, a, a special topics journal on this, this exact slide, and so it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with the newest fields look like. But on this sort of like most basic level, a lot of folks think that our memory appears to kind of group into two categories. Right? First one is episodic memory. This is memory for our daily events and episodes. It's often described as our mental diary. Um, where we just kind of can remember that, like, I had uh, soup for lunch today, that kind of thing. Okay. Whereas semantic memory, which is to me where, what I do a lot of work in, is more of a fact-based knowledge. It's our mental dictionary, or sometimes called the mental lexicon, um, or an encyclopedia. And that's interesting because there is clearly some sort of shared representation, or we wouldn't know... Um, what like we wouldn't be able to talk to each other about what dogs are but also trying to capture that individualistic difference between folks right that is clearly embedded in an episodic memory right? so they work together uh, and then the lexicon being our mental mental dictionary so the dictionary can have events tied to it right so you know what a american football game is maybe as compared to everyone else's description of football um, because you've been to a game, you've watched a game on TV. Right, so some very classic semantic theories say that for semantics, right, so not episodic memory, we're going to focus on semantic memory, is that there are essential denotations for words, this kind of core meaning. If you remember our category lecture, we kind of covered this idea where there's like this checklist of things that are defining or a concept. And then there's also a connotation. These are all of its secondary meanings. Um, they're emotional values, they're slang terms, they're evaluative associations. I mean, this is like kind of everything else. And so this point here is trying to capture that when you say dog, right, the denotation is most likely the furry animal. Okay. Its connotation depends on the sentence. Um, or the or the the understanding of what else is going on. Um, so you know, if you're watching a Clint Eastwood movie, um, him using the word dog probably means something else. And if that analogy didn't work for you, um, this is sort of the idea that if people call you a dirty dog, they're not calling you a smelly for a four-legged creature, right? There's a different connotation there. And we've covered this concept a lot, but now it's really important because as we get into um, the semantic vector models and these semantic theories, polysemy is a problem. Okay? It's words with multiple meanings, and that's often difficult for us to capture in a model because context is so important. The context is very um, laborious or big pain to code in these models. And I often argue that context doesn't really matter because um, there are ways to capture that that are close enough. Um, but there are several types of models that we'll cover this semester where we don't include context locally, like the words right next to it, and we do include context and you know which one performs better. So we'll do a couple weeks of 
vector space models like LSA and topics, and then we'll do a week of um, word to vec that does capture context, and we'll be able to tell, right, can we map multiple meanings out of this data? And so some theories. There's this idea that maybe we understand what words mean um, by just reference. Words, on printed words on the page mean what they refer to in the world. Okay, so dog means the bird creature on the floor. Quit. Who is currently trying to eat her bandage on her leg. Stop. Okay. Uh, so that means what it refers to. Okay. However, there's a lot of abstract concepts going on like right now, like truth, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of, of things that don't have like a touchable, tangible thing in the world that they refer to. They're not quite so concrete, right? So maybe it's intention. So the relationship of that um, word to, to other things, it's sort of this abstract, well, you know, I can't touch truth, but I have a good feeling for what it is because of my understanding of these other concepts. Okay. And then there's extension, where it's what it stands for in the physical world. Right. Uh, and these two things can match. Right? They don't have to be different, but often they are. Okay. And so then there's this whole set of theories that we kind of covered in category learning. We talked about um, theory theories, but it wasn't a very good name. Here, here it is again, truth theory semantics, which are these kind of mathematical models of complex meaning. So they try to capture the fact that there are um, different references, different intentions, different extensions, connotations, denotations. Like how do we map language? Because right? if I can do that, there are lots of things I can do, like AI. Okay. And so the early work in this area is trying to just build these networks, right? So we know how, um, well, maybe not in the 1970s, but now we kind of know how the brain works. And so we can maybe build these models that best represent um, that kind of semantic network in the brain. Right? A lot of Google, like Google Translate, it's built on these kinds of concepts. Right? So they use, um, a deep learning type of AI that allows them to translate between languages that maybe they've never been able to train. And that a lot of those ideas are based in these early theories on semantics. Okay. So concepts are linked together because they just occur together a lot. It's also described as association. So things like peanut butter, and that's a phrase or a coloquit, um, sometimes called a bigram, that occurs more frequently together than one might expect. And towards the end of the semester, we'll talk about how do you define that, that type of similarity. Like these kind of occur together more than I might expect. But then we also have this idea of concepts having the same meaning. And so for a long time, I thought these were very separate things. And I had some, uh, some read some papers recently that talked about this as a continuum. Right? So there are words that are linked together purely because of association. They have nothing in common on their checklists. Like, I guess peanut butter is a, the peanuts and butter are both food. That would really be the only thing they have in common. And we have words that are that are clearly perfect synonyms. Well, not perfect, but synonyms, right? Because they share the exact same meaning. And we have everything in between. Right? So there are words that um, share many similar features and have also um, used a lot in context together, like cats and dogs. And so we have this kind of continuum of this idea of like, use versus meaning okay. and we can capture those in these kind of uh, theoretical models and then in a couple of weeks we'll do the actual like computational models um, but it's nice to start here um, explaining this so that later you can be like oh yeah that thing that she talked about uh, mostly driven by some work by Collins and Quillian and then Collins and Loftus okay. so let's look at those models and I'm sorry for the terrible graphic, but the, the PDF, it, it looks this bad. So Collins and Quillian is a pretty famous theory about 1969, I think is when this got published. Um, trying to build a model of memory that captured those categorical models that we talked about 
of the understanding of features and their relationship between concepts. So the two big category models that we talked about were like a checklist of required features, but also the relationship of prototypes and exemplars between each other. So I know cats and dogs are very similar because they have similar features. So you have to have both models. And this model tries to combine the two. Um, and so what it is, is it's a hierarchical model of um, objects and categories that is built on that concept of, of basic level names, bird, superordinate names, it's an animal, subordinate names, canaries. Okay, so you can read these up. A canary is a bird, which is an animal. Okay. Or you can move across. Uh, so these are basic level names across. These are more specific down here. And then they have their features tied to them. Um, now, it is assumed here that if canary is a bird, it has all of these features. Okay, here's the problem, though. The ostrich is that weird one where I have to add in, like, oh, P.S., this one can't fly. Okay. This is back to that idea of, of there are features that are common, but they're not all shared. So this model is really popular for a while. Um, and this is the basic gist that WordNet, the online dictionary, is built upon, is this hierarchical language, um, this hierarchy system. And that works well for very concrete objects, right? things that are touchable, that I can easily make these lists, defining feature lists for. Where would I put truth in this? I pick, I pick truth because it's an easy abstract concept because um, you can't see it right? uh, like you can birds. But there are plenty of other abstract concepts like love right? um, that are difficult to put into these hierarchies. Where would I, where would I put that? Okay. Even if I had a different branch of the hierarchy. And so... Um, the models kind of, they work well, but only for specific types of things. And if we're trying to model memory, obviously we need to model all types of things. Okay. So let's just kind of talk about this. So it was developed to translate between languages, because if I build that same hierarchy for every language, I can map them directly onto each other. I think it's a bit naive, right? Uh, we have a better concept now that slang and multiple meanings make this kind of one-to-one -one mapping difficult. Okay. Um, it works well for natural categories, like things like animals and trees. Okay. Uh, and it's built on a hierarchy, kind of like biology. I always think of like kingdom, phylum, and class. And I think that's where the idea came from. Um, but obviously, that is not all of the words we use. It's not even a substantial portion of the words we use. Okay. The links going up and down are is a bird is a canary, or sorry, canary is a bird, which is an animal. The links going out are has a relationships, meaning they, they can, you know, contain these things, um, they fly, that kind of thing. And the way that they kind of supported this model is that the sentence verification task, um, which I think we did a couple weeks ago now, not last week, but um, a dog is an animal, yes. Okay. Excuse me. And that uh, type of data does support this hierarchy. However, okay, like we just said, not all information can really be represented in this sort of manner, um, and not even well, honestly. It ignores what's called conjoint frequency, or how frequently words co-occur. So um, it ignores association and focuses only on meaning. And people, in general, don't reject all untrue statements equally fast or equally slow. So, if I said a pine is a church, that actually is a pretty slow response from people. When we think about how long it takes people to read and stuff, um, that's cognitively slow. Because pine and church have this embedded relationship because the benches in many churches are made from pine. Okay? Or at least people perceive this. They're made from wood, so pine is a type of wood. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's that, like, weird, what's called a mediated association of, like, church to wood to pine. Um, and so people are slow. It's like, no, pine's a tree. Okay. 
if I say a pine is a flower, even though they both are types of plants, um, you're much faster than No, it's not. It's a tree. Okay. And that kind of weird effect, the relatedness effect, should be captured by these models. Like, we should capture that mediated association um, somehow. And uh, also the prototypicality effect where um, the, the members of categories are faster than others. And if we look at the model, canary and ostrich are on the same level here, so they should be equally representative of bird, and we know they're not. So we've got to capture the fact that the features embedded here on the sides have a probability and uh, the relatedness effect. And then we have to capture the fact that the items themselves, the, the members of a category, have a probability and a relatedness effect. So, you know, this model is a great start, but what could be better? And around this time, what is happening, so this is 1975 now, um, what's being published are connectionist models. And connectionist models are early forms of neural net models. So sometimes you'll see them used um, interchangeably, and um, many connectionist models are what we would now consider neural net models. Uh, kind of depends on which one you're working with. But uh, sometimes this is called parallel distributed processing. Most of us will call these neural nets now. And so that's being published around the same time. So that's kind of a, a, an inspiration for um, the newer model, which a lot of people agree uh, you know, with some some caveats, is probably a better representation. Um, is the spreading activation model, and this is a network model, and we're going to do network models in a couple weeks. And the idea here is that every one of these nodes is a concept. Concepts might be features, or concepts might be the like words themselves. Now, this particular representation has both. So red is generally a feature, but it's also a concept by itself. Like leg. You know, dogs have legs. Right? Um, leg is a feature of dogs, but it's also a thing, right? A concept all by itself that has definitions. So this allows us to kind of make those related to their, you know, features related to their concepts with a weight that captures that probability and allows us to relate concept, concept to bird to, uh, I'm sorry, ostrich to canary here with a specific weight and canary to bird with a weight, and canary to ostrich with a weight. So this captures those relatedness and prototypicality effects a little bit better. Okay. Now, spreading activation is this idea, and we'll cover this more next week, is this idea that when one of these little nodes lights up, okay, it gets seen, it gets red, it gets turned on, so to speak. Um, other nodes tend to also light up. And I always think of this akin to describing this as like um, spilling water, right? So yesterday I was sitting, I like knocked over a soda, um, and since that stuff is carbonated, it's like <laughs> spraying everywhere, right? And so it spread quickly. <laughs> now I'm like scrambling to clean it up, the dog's trying to lick it, it was crazy. Um, so if I see something that's uh, red, generally people start with fire engine, but let's start with red. I immediately other colors come to mind okay? and things that are red come to mind like flowers, sunsets, fruits. Okay? And so the idea here is that if I see a fire engine race past, it could activate other vehicles, could activate the idea of emergency ambulances. Okay? So there's a, a abstract concept captured there, emergency. Okay? It could relate to red because fire engines are red which then would lead me to flowers. So I can understand that mediated relationship. So if I activate church, church is related to wood, to benches, which is related to wood, which is related to pine. So this captures that effect of the, the associations that are built in um, just because of, of events, that we, things that we know about. Right? Uh, and so this model is very popular. And I would say it's inspired a lot of, of the newer models, there's ways to program this as a neural net model and not as a network model, and we'll do both. Okay. <clears throat> so the structure here is a bit more complex 
because the hierarchical model has this like nice intuitive feel that we could just maybe make this giant dictionary of words and like relate every word to every other word and be done with it. But I think given multiple meanings, that's not possible. Okay. And so what we have are these little nodes, which are our concepts. The concept nodes can vary in strength. The structure is not hierarchical, it's distributed, often is what it's called. Okay. This is an early connectionist model, so things are linked together. And priming, which we'll cover next week, is based on spreading activation. So priming is this idea that when you see one object, it makes the next object easier to process. So if I'm reading a story about the riots we've been having this week, um, the, the reading of certain words will make the next words faster. So let's say if I read um, about riot, I might expect fire, because okay, that's been a lot of what's been going on in the world. Um, and those two things are linked by association, and the activation, the reading of the first word will lead me to the second word. And I'll give you a demonstration of that next week. So <clears throat> now we can capture semantic features, these smaller units of meaning that themselves have features. So features have features. So that's another problem we've got to deal with. Because a feature itself can be a concept. Okay? So a feature of computers is a mouse. Okay? Uh, but ma ma mice have features as well. And then there's that's a problem because the, the mouse, computer mouse, is not the same thing as mouse, um, tiny animal mouse. Okay? Uh, and this allows us to break down concepts or words into their features and features become concepts break down into their features. So this kind of captures this embedded um, uh, correlated error that we have. And this uh, works well kind of for simple domains. And the more complex models work well for uh, like, a, like a network model uh, or do, do better at com complex concepts. And what people were trying to define, and I actually read, a, I thought we were kind of done with this topic. <laughs> Um, as a field until I, uh, like the other day, was reading a review for a paper and realized that we weren't, is that people are still trying to figure out these, these semantic primitives. What is the smallest amount of features that I can use to represent a concept? Okay. Uh, and they did it really interesting, it was kind of neat, um, where they had these, these features of words and they showed them to them one at a time until people guessed what the word was correctly, which has got, it's like a, I couldn't remember the name of the game that this was, this was, but it's like that pub game that you play where it's got like fact one and fact two and you're supposed to guess which multiple choice answer is right. Um, and the sooner you guess, the more points you get. So obviously there's some benefit to knowing what is the minimum amount of things, descriptors that I can use so people know what my product is basically. And this kind of um, thought process allows us to think about reading. Because one of the, like, I feel like a lot of NLP people kind of gloss over the fact that much of the work is like trying to understand what people do when they're processing text, right? So reading or listening. Um, or I guess if you're blind, feeling. But I would call that reading, you're just reading in a different way. Um, so, uh, back to where, where my brain just took, took a fart. Uh, what was I? Right, so most of, of understanding language is like, what do people do when they're reading? Because obviously if you're a business person, you want to know, like when they're reading my ad or they're reading our description for our product or they're reading our health guide or our frequently asked questions, whatever, wh how do we know that they're interpreting that the way we mean it? Sometimes the answer here is to ask, I think you'll find out real quick. Um, but this idea of like, how do I build the simplest meaning? How do I build the clearest meaning? So kind of some older work says, well, if I just know each individual's word meaning, I can build up the meaning of the document, okay, or the text or the tweet, whatever, from each individual word. Okay. That like intuitively sounds really cool. Except um, this idea it does not work well for slang <laughs> or um, idioms. So these things that have individual, the words themselves have these one meaning, but then once you um, put them all together, you realize it means something else. Right? 
So cats and photo or idea was like, well, here's what people do. Okay, they take the word that they're reading, hearing, whatever, and they break it down into features. Okay, so the model um, lights up the node for bird, and then all the features of bird starts to activate through spreading activation. If that doesn't give me quite <coughs> there, I might say, well, there's some restraints from these other words. So here I know that we're talking about, um, can't use bird, sorry, I'm back up. So let's say we say, I saw the red thing, okay, so red, okay, that activates all these other things. Well, the previous sentence was talking about uh, uh, trucks. So a red thing might be a fire engine. So I'm gonna limit this to only red cars. And so we're slowly kind of filtering based on the other individual words that we've seen. Okay. So an example might be kick. And if you're reading along, kicking is something that you, you do to only certain types of objects. Right? So if I said, I kicked the moon, you'd be like, okay, hmm, I can't really kick the moon. I mean, if we're reading a sci-fi story, that might be different. But in general, if I said I kicked the moon, like just in launch, you'd be like, what? <laughs> what? Okay. Um, yeah, so that word has features that limit what the other possible options could be. And um, this idea is kind of, it kind of works. Okay. Still, people still support these, these theories, um, but now they're a little bit more complex. Like people read chunks of words instead of one word at a time. And they are slowly predicting what word might come next. And it's not slow, it's actually quite fast. Um, we're, we're sort of expectancy generating. So we're saying, well, I just saw this word, so this one's probably next. Okay. And that would jive with my current interpretation of what's going on. So we're sort of building these little mental mini movies of the action. Okay. <clears throat> and so we'll talk about that idea, menti mental movies, not next week, regression, um, in a couple weeks. And so that leads me to this idea that words, okay, all of that taken together implies that words themselves have these profiles. They have these uh, gangs. They're actually literally sometimes called gangs, but this is more about pronunciation. So um, words have <coughs> all the things that are similar pronunciation wise. And so, and sometimes they're called gangs because they all are pronounced the same word except the one lone wolf that's pronounced differently. So um, uh, for example, cave, dave, wave, save, and then there's have. <laughs> Should be pronounced hey, right? Um, so there are not for pronunciation for speech, but instead for meaning, there are, are words, they have these shades of meaning, these different features, right? And what we can do is start to group them together based on that profile, these shared features, or these shared similarities, even if they're not features. And so um, this is kind of a similar approach. So I think in like straight science terms, people call this behavioral profiles. I don't like to call it behavioral profiling because that has a very different connotation in normal world stuff. Um, when we're thinking more like FBI and serial killers for behavioral profiles. Uh, so I will tell you that this is cluster analysis <laughs> uh, where we're trying to now group or classify instances based on some set of features or linguistic variables. And we've kind of been doing that this whole time where, you know, we started with conditional inference trees and that's like combinations of features. And then we also looked at, um, oh gosh, uh, logistic regression where we're trying to predict the features that predict that group. Right? So now we're just going to do cluster analysis that allows us to classify without the answer. So everything we've had so far has been like, I have these features and I have the category. Can I now do some, some work with that? Um, that is essentially a supervised task where we have the answer so we can compare. Now, maybe we don't have the answer. We just have a bunch of variables and we wanna see how they group together. Okay, so cluster analysis really allows us to fill that void as an unsupervised task. 
And so we generally do this kind of work on a large set of variables. Um, and if the data is all categorical, we transform it into proportions. Okay, so it's very specifically in science terms, a cluster analysis on, on totally categorical data, sometimes called a behavioral profile. I would just call it cluster because people know that term better. And it has less connotations. Okay. And so we might code a bunch of sentences for these different pieces of lexical information. We might take all these feature sets and then transform them into proportions because we need numbers somehow. And that approach is really useful for um, words with multiple meanings because a word that has two meanings will sort of split between clusters. It can't literally split, but it will cluster in an interesting way. So let's try this. We're going to look at the same data using uh, causal constructions and now use the larger data set where we have um, animacy. Remember the, the actor's animate or the act D is animate, the person being acted upon. Um, we have the type of event in the sentence. If it's negative or not, if it's a co-reference, I'm doing the action to myself, or it's possessive. And what we found before, when we've looked at this data a couple times, is the first three variables appear to be very important, and the rest of them maybe not so much. But now I'm not interested in clustering the variables. I'm going to cluster the instances. So you can do cluster analysis on the variables or the instances. So I can turn this either way. It's a reason I really like cluster, too. So step one. This is all totally categorical. So I need to convert this to a number somehow uh, to adequately run my analysis. Step two, to do this, any kind of cluster analysis, so this is step one for categorical data. This is true of, of all cluster analyses. I have to create a distance between the variables. So we're gonna project this into low dimensional space and calculate how far apart these these variables or instances are from each other in low dimensional space. And then run cluster. So cluster analysis is run on distances, not raw data. Last step, what happened? As usual, the interpretive dance part, right, where you are interpreting and understanding your analysis. And then what we see is validation. So it might be a cross, doing it on multiple data sets. Or in our case, we'll do um, some, um, not bootstrapping, we'll have it run multiple times. Permutation, permutation is what I'm looking for. All right, so we're gonna calculate this on verb profiles, where we've got all these different instances. Before we had only looked at like one or the other, now we have a bunch. So we have things like be made to be to verb, cause verb, get to verb, get past tense verb, get present participle tense. So these are different tenses of get, and then different tenses of have, and then make. So at first glance, what I might think is that, well, get is all the same verb, so why wouldn't those cluster together? And so is have. But maybe the way that we use get to go versus get going is different and that captures the different shades of meaning there and so they'll appear in different clusters. So I could essentially assess how much these different forms have different meanings. All right, so specifically for um, Categorical data. So this type of thing you would not do if the data is already continuous. You would start at distances, but because the data is not continuous, I have to do this first. So I'm going to use a split function. Okay, and what that does is it takes the the factor variable here and creates a list. So it like takes the data frame that's one big data frame of each you know variable on a row. Um, and breaks it into like here's the mini data frame for get going and here's the mini data frame for get to go and here's the data frame for have. Okay. Then I am going to use L apply here to drop the um, 
the factor label. And that's just so that it, it doesn't repeat itself when I put this back together. Uh, because I split on that variable. So I split on the variable and then I just dropped it. Then this particular function is in Rling. And what it does is it converts the data frame from a bunch of categories to the proportions that we find in each category. So instead of um, the animacy of the actor being yes or no, it's now two columns, animacy yes, animacy no, and it's a proportion in each one. So we're just transforming this into like the, essentially a complex table for each variable. And then do call, which is one of my favorite functions on a list, will rbind them or put them all back together. Okay. So we split them up, we calculated the proportions uh, split up, and then we bound them back together. There was a lot of noise in the hallway. I'm going to investigate one second. What are you doing? I was just staring at the door. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Okay. Nothing suspicious. This is like if any of you have children when it gets suspiciously quiet. Okay. In our house, I mean, everybody's asleep. But now when it gets suspiciously, like, jingly because somebody's walking around a bunch and their collar is jingling, hold on. That's usually not a good sign. All right. Okay. So, brief interruption. Moving on. Here's what that final data set looks like. So, hopefully, this is a little clearer what it's doing. Across B made to V, okay, so across all the instances of B made, it's broken this down into the possible categories. So it's animate or it's inanimate, and then it's calculated the, the basically the probabilities of those events. So pretty much, if, if you're using B made to go, so to speak, um, this could be any verb. Be made to kick. That's not really. That doesn't make sense. Be made to eat. Like if you're making your kids eat something. Um, uh, ninety-six percent of the time it's animate, and then it did that for each variable. So we end up with more columns here and less rows because we've collapsed by row. So this essentially, I, I bet you could do this with like dplyr, um, and it's kind of a summarized function okay, if you're more of a tidyverse person. All right, so now we have this numeric data frame instead of, of a completely factored data frame. I can get rolling. Okay. And so what we do in the second step is we calculate distances. So now we're trying to quantify the relationship between concepts by seeing how much they match. Okay. So we'll cover this more in our similarity section, but the logic behind a distance measure instead of a similarity measure is that we're trying to capture similarity by seeing how close together they are. In that cities that are in that are close, like Dallas and Fort Worth, that's basically one giant city at this point. They're very close to each other. They kind of grew together. Are more similar in nature than, let's say, Dallas to New York. And that's physical distance. They're very far apart, um, but culturally pretty different. Um, we can do the same thing with words. So words that have a small distance are more similar because they uh, occupy the same space. Words that have a far distance are less similar. That's the opposite of a, a normal similarity measure. So a normal similarity measure like correlation, we have things like zero means nothing, right? no similarity, and one means perfect similarity. Distance measures are the other way around. Zero means they're basically the same because they're on top of each other. Whereas a large number, this distance isn't bounded, okay, it just can't be negative, um, a large number means they're very different. And so we always have to, have, when you, someone presents you a, 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 me, a similarity measure, you have to ask, is it a distance measure or an association measure? Okay. And we have a whole week on that concept, so we'll do that later. Um, but the idea here is the more similar the vector or the profile, the closer they are at distance, so they're going to group together, so they get a low score. 
Uh, three popular types of distance calculations include Euclidean. Euclidean is the most popular. It um, is essentially the hypotenuse, the direct relationship between P and Q in a um, low dimensional space. Manhattan distance is probably the second most popular, where we go like from P over and then up to Q. Okay. And so in this uh, particular example, that would be, I guess, 11. Uh, maximum distance is like the whichever side's the longest, right? over to P, um, from P over, or from P up. Okay. So it's the longest side, basically. And so I'm going to use Euclidean because I do. I don't have a good reason. <laughs> uh, Euclidean just works well, and I tend to get the same answer as Euclidean or Manhattan, but they, I mean they'll give you slightly different answers because they're different math. But conceptually, the, the, the structural relationships tend to be the same. All right. So this distance function is in base R. What you do is you put in the raw data, the numeric data frame, whatever the num numbers are, but it has to be numeric. Tell it what method. This is Euclidean. And here is now what that looks like. So it, it's not a correlation table, but it's got that feel of a correlation table. Because the distance between B made to V and B made to V is zero, so it's dropped that piece out. And it's only the bottom half because the distance from cause to get is the same either direction. And these will vary here, but what you don't want to see basically is one number that is very different from the rest. So let's say we have one row where all the numbers were 100 and all the rest of these are ones. That's usually a bad time and you need to drop that variable. And one reason that can happen is the scaling of the variable. So if one variable is scaled, you know, if, one, if all the variables are like one to five, it's your normal kind of like Likert scale, uh, and then one of them is like one to 300. Okay. It'll help if you convert them all to a similar scale before distancing. And on the homework, you'll see this problem. All right, so um, this can be used on any kind of numeric vector. So semantic vector space models that we'll get to in a couple of weeks are really rely on this idea. So cluster analysis is really not so far away from something like an LSA um, because they're using this concept of distance. Okay. And the homework itself is going to focus on data that's continuous. So there are lots of types of clustering. Now that we have the data prepared, let's talk about the analysis itself. I'm going to do hierarchical cluster analysis because I like it, and I feel like there's tons of tutorials on k-means. And if you can understand hierarchical cluster, you can get k-means. Okay. So I want to cover one that I don't feel like a lot of people see, okay. uh, and, I, and they work about the same. I mean, they're different math, clearly, um, but uh, you can go either direction. So what, what's the difference here um, is uh, this creates a dendrogram, much like that conditional inference tree, but conditional inference trees break down the data into smaller and smaller chunks. This m changes whatever you're clustering, and it groups the chunks that are most similar together. Uh, hierarchical cluster analysis works from the leaves up, okay. so each individual piece and slowly groups them together. Every object or variable that you're going to include here is a different leaf, and then those branches of similar objects are merged together. And so growing from the roots, so one big cluster and breaking them down, into the leaves is called divisive clustering because you're dividing. Okay. That's what k-means does. I'm pretty sure. Actually, now I'm not sure. I think so. Don't quote me on this. But there's a section of variables that are divisive clustering. One big cluster, break them down. Okay. Or we can go from leaves to roots, okay, where we have all the leaves and then we um, merge branches. Let's just say merge branches. And that's called agglomerative clustering or combining clustering. 
within those two directions of clustering, um, we can pick an algorithm to cluster by. So I can do complete, single, average, and ward. And I, I honestly don't see anybody doing stuff that isn't ward. Okay, that's a double negative. Most people pick ward because it has been shown to provide more compact clusters, which that will make sense in a minute. Okay, and now I really want to know, k-means clustering, uh, I think it's divisive. Divisive, that would be a word. Oh, divisive clustering. Top down, mammoth. Yeah, so I think it's, I think it, that one works. One big cluster out, and the one we're going to do is leave up. But they will, um, um, provide generally often this, a similar answer. It's never the exact same, but a similar answer. All right. So let's do this. This is in the cluster package okay. and the function is H plus for a hierarchical cluster. This here needs to be the distance measure. So I've tried to label these pretty clearly where BP is the numeric data frame and dot dist is the distance data frame. Okay. So make sure you're paying attention to which one goes where. And we're going to use ward with a D2 algorithm and that's just a, a correction on ward to make it run better. So what can I do? Well, I can plot it. Okay. Again, I'm going to tell you I love this, this package in R um, and the most R packages because the plot function is so stupidly easy. This is not true in Python, as you will see. Okay. I swear in a couple weeks we'll switch, and I'll be like, Python's so much better. But right now, we're still on the R is so much better side. Okay. Now let's see what happened here. What I've got now is the leaves. The hang, a negative one here, just makes all the leaves hang together, so you can read it a little better. Okay. The clusters start over here, because they have the shorter clustering piece. So the first two to get combined together are get and have and then be made to, and then another get and have, okay, before these get all combined. And then we get make and cause, combine with have, and get go ing. So my first interpretation here, without knowing anything about how to pick how many clusters there are, is that I'm probably wrong about the assumption that all of these forms of get are the same. They don't all hang out together. We have a get and a have, a get and a have, and a get and a have. Okay. And they're clearly somewhat different from each other. Okay. So that's our first interpretation. There is some, some different meanings and different profiles of these different forms of the word. Okay. It might be tense. Okay. And it might be that simple because these are um, present tense, past tense, and participle tense, or gerund tense sometimes is what it's called. And so now I can kind of tell where um, where be made to cause and make are going to go. But look, made, this is the same word. They're very different from each other. They're on opposite ends. So that's a, that's a fairly quick interpretation. But if I were to say, well, okay, let's group these together and see if we can come up with like one, a set of similar meanings. How many clusters should I pick? Well, I have one, two. Five, six, seven, eight, nine variables. Well, how many do I pick? Well, enter um, silhouette analysis. Okay. So what we'll calculate is the silhouette width. Silhouette distance is considered um, how well formed the clusters are. So a well formed cluster means that the um, internal profiles or the internal rows are um, their distances are very close, and once it's from one cluster to another, they're externally very far. I liken this to the idea of like um, cliques in high school where you all eat at the same table, so all the band kids sit here, all the jocks sit here, and they don't mix, right? So you don't have that one band kid that's also a cheerleader, okay? <clears throat> Uh, silhouette distance measures from zero. There are no clusters. This is just a bunch of random noise. 
to one perfectly clustered, I would be suspicious if I got a one, because that kind of perfect separation is a little unusual in this kind of data. And so there's a function here called, uh, I think of it as cut tree, because I'm cutting my tree, and I can pick how many clusters I want. And so if I say, well, let's go with two clusters, okay, because one is not a cluster, <laughs> so let's go with the minimum, which would be two, and it can tell, it'll tell me which category it would go into. So it'll cut my tree for me and make those groups. This function is very useful if you're going to use this as a classification algorithm. And this is the thing you would use to say, which group do they go into? Silhouette um, provides a bunch of noise, so I just told it to give me, okay, well, with two clusters and the distance measure, make sure you put in distance here, um, not the raw data, what's the average silhouette width for a two-cluster model? 0.44. Well, that number doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's somewhere in the middle between 0 and 1. Great. <clears throat> so silhouette distance is a much more useful measure compared. So now we can use um, the more of the apply family, so s apply. We're going to run 2 to 8. And so why 2 to 8? Well, 1 is not a cluster. Okay, 1 is the entire data, so that defeats the purpose of this analysis. So we're going to run 2 as our minimum number of clusters up to n minus 1 clusters. I have 9 variables. And so the reason you don't run 9 is because now it's not a cluster anymore, it's just each individual variable. Okay, so minimally I can have 2 for a cluster, maximally I can have um, 2 of them go together and everybody else is separate. Okay, so it's n minus 1 categories. So 2 to 8, so that's why the 8 here. And then we just run, um, essentially this is a little loop, and we fill in the 2 to 8 is going to get filled in here where x is. And it's going to print them all out. So what we see is that um, 2 and 3 have very similar silhouette distances. And then there's diminishing returns for um, increasing the number of clusters. So this is probably 2 or 3 clusters. And that's how I might pick how many categories I have coming out of the data. Cool. Well, let's look at that. Okay. So I can plot now and have it draw these cool lines on here <laughs> with the rectangular H clust. Can you tell it how many clusters you want? Okay. So two clusters, I don't have two on here. Two clusters is this right side versus the left side. Three clusters does not make a lot of sense because then a cluster is one variable by itself. So I would argue that the added silhouette distance here is not enough for me to separate this one variable out. Okay, and that's just my interpretation. You could say, well, it's actually useful to separate this group out by itself because it's very different, but that silhouette distance difference is very small. Okay, so I would build this into two clusters. Okay. One cluster that appears to be um, past and present tense, one cluster that appears to kind of be participle tense. Okay, this is not a perfect interpretation um, because I, I kind of don't know which variable caused this, this distinction between these clusters. Right. So let's do that. We can create what's called a snake plot. Right. So we can create these cluster analyses um, and maybe I can interpret, you know, knowing what I know about the word have and knowing what I know about the word get, but I have these variables underneath, right? There's animacy, possessiveness, all that kind of stuff. Those can tell me what features are present in each cluster. Okay, so this answers the why question. Why did I get these clusters? Okay. So snake plot allows us to figure out why the clusters are what they are right, and what, what that actually makes itself out to be. And so what happens mathematically is that you group, you tell it how many clusters you want, we're going to go two, and you group, um, 
group them together and create these sort of different scores. You just create a, a mean for the cluster and you subtract from each other. And you plot those differences. So you have to do this um, one cluster at a, a pairwise. So if you had three clusters, you'd have to do one to two, and then two to three, and then one to three for a snake plot. You can't kind of get all of them on here at once. Um, so we'll just calculate this for two clusters. And so what we do is we say, okay, here's my cluster grouping. So here's what classification label I would give them. I'm going to split the raw data into two calculate the differences between those two pieces. So what are the um, differences in column means for all of my variables? So it kind of averages the raw data and then subtracts. I'm going to plot those differences. All right, so in this plot, you can do this in ggplot too, but base R works fine. This 1.2 is just a made up number to kind of physically separate them on the graph so they don't all lay on top of each other. This is like ggplot's jitter function. We're going to uh, create a y-axis that is just from counting up from one to the number of uh, different scores that I have. Type equals n is an empty plot, so I can add some labels to it. xlab here, this is a bit of a misnomer as well, um, and I'll tell you why in a second. ylab is nothing. Then we add text to that plot, and we tell it to sort the differences from lowest to highest, and add their names. So what you end up with is this graph here. And here's why I said this x-axis is not perfect. You have to pay attention to what the x-axis actually is, because um, zero means there's no difference between the clusters. So variables that are right on the zero are not informative. Okay? They do not separate your clusters. So this will match our logistic regression. This will match our, our original conditional inference tree and check out what's in the middle. This co-reference, this negative variable, and this possessiveness. And if you've been awake for the other lectures, hopefully you remember that those variables didn't do us any good before. And they still don't now. And that's this is a point I really want to make because um, each week we're doing this like, here's an analysis, here's an analysis, here's an analysis. And I really want you to get right here that a lot of times they agree. And which one you pick will be kind of what is my goal right, in this analysis. Um, and which one best informs that goal. Or run multiple, you know, run a couple of them. See which, um, which ones help answer and get you to the solution to whatever analytic problem you have. Okay? Uh, because they agree. That came up in our conditional inference tree as well. Now, sometimes the data you have makes it obvious which analysis you should use, hopefully. Um, but not all the time. Like, if the data is totally categorical, I could see this going in several different ways. All right, that rant aside, um, make like things look at zero. So when you're pr printing this out for the example assignment, um, pay attention to the number here because it might be that you don't you only see variables that are informative for one side um, or the other okay so if you have a lot of variables you might not be able to print the whole thing and you only see like a section of the data all right that being said uh in this particular example cluster one is more over here because these are positive variable cluster two is more over here and the reason that works out is because of the way we subtracted. So if it's a positive number, it's more towards cluster one. And so what do we see? Well, for the cluster one, the um, mostly it's animate. Check them out. They're both animate and maybe social here. Okay. For cluster two, they're inanimate. That is a nice clean split. This is so great. Uh, it's, it's not made of data, but it's almost too perfect, <laughs> right? So I can tell that the differences in these verbs are who is doing the action on, and like what's the action in the sentence. If it's a thinking human being, it's going to be cluster one. If it's inanimate objects, it's going to be cluster two. And that is really what's defining these, not the tense of the verbs. Because I don't have tense as a variable. I should, but I don't. And so that kind of like completes the, the 
analysis um, where I can create the classifications and I can give you something to interpret the classifications. I can get the, the what is driving the analysis. I can also validate my solution. Now this, you know, always better if you have multiple data sets and crossfold and all that stuff, but let's say you don't have that. We're gonna bootstrap. It's not permutation, sorry, my brain tonight. Permutation was, is another analysis. Have we covered that yet? Conditional inference trees are permutated. This is bootstrapped. Um, so, and we'll do some more bootstrapping and linear regression, which I think is next. Okay. Uh, so bootstrapping, remember, is this idea where we um, sample from the data and run the analysis over and over again to see how stable it is. Because if I sample from the data and I get totally different answers each time, it's not a very stable analysis. Okay. Permutation scrambles the data and tells you how likely you are to get your results versus being scrambled. Okay. And you want your results to, to replicate. Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry, in permutation, you want your results to be the right answer and the scrambled one to be different. So you want the numbers to be small. In bootstrapping, you want the results to replicate, so they're kind of the opposite of each other. So you want the, the numbers to be the same with each bootstrap. And to do that, we'll use PVCLUST. Okay. So PVCLUST, unfortunately, runs a little differently than HCLUST. It runs on the raw data because it has a method here of, of calculating the distance built into the function. And then it runs uh, the cluster analysis on the columns instead of the rows. So the T here is transpose, it just means flip the data frame. So uh, most cluster analyses run on the rows. This one runs on columns. I hate this, but you know, you can't control because people write these packages and they're different people. So um, flip the data frame and run that same hierarchical cluster we've already run. So we have the same setup here. And what we end up with are these approximately unbiased um, bootstrap numbers. And then we have bootstrap probability. Okay. And these are different than normal probabilities, like I just said. We want this to replicate. So we want numbers to be high, not low. And then we can plot it. So my cause PVC instead of um, clust here, uh, plot. And then we, you'll see the exact same plot. If you don't see the exact same plot, something has gone <laughs> horribly wrong. Um, you didn't set it up the same way. Okay. And then the numbers here are um, the bootstrap probabilities. Okay. I don't per totally remember the difference between these, but in general, you want them both to be high. Okay. And so the, the, and then there's no good cutoff score here. Um, obviously, less than 50% implies that it's a coin flip. Okay. So this one over here is kind of problematic. Okay. It's not clear um, how many times, where get is going to kind of go. And that makes sense because our silhouette distances imply to us that it could be two or it could be three. And so this variable is kind of flip-flopping around. Okay. Um, and this one over here as well. So what's probably happening here is these two clusters are very close together right, in the space here. And so sometimes maybe make goes with have first, or sometimes cause maybe goes with have first. Mm. But in general, I would say this is pretty, pretty good with the two exceptions on this side. So does it seem to, I don't want to use the word replicate, does it seem to be stable? Yeah. All right. So that's a kind of the steps in R. R definitely wins this battle, but let's look a little bit at Python here. Okay. Uh, so this is my PyConfig, so I'm gonna scroll down here. First step, move the data from R, because we have it in R, to Python. Okay. I actually, this is R chunk still, and the first thing I did was rename it, because when I was making these lectures, I um, forgot that Python uses dots for functions. So, you know, like, it's like um, variable name dot lower to make it lowercase. Uh, 
but then I left it in because it's an easy, like if you're an R person, because I um, mostly do my work in R, it's easy to forget. So I, I just want to kind of use this here as an example. Uh, I named all of these with, with all these saved outputs and data frames with dots, right? So cause.bp, this is my numeric data frame, and cause.dist is my distance data frame. Um, but it's probably better, right, to use underscores because in Python those dots are interpreted as a variable. Right? So just to highlight a difference between the two languages. All right, the other thing I did here was save the row names because right? those are built in to the R packet, R data set, and um, our, sorry, everyone is chatting right now and texting, so I was turning off the sound. Um, they're built into the data frame in R, but once we transfer this over into Python, those kind of get lost. So, hanging on to them. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to import uh, from SciPy the uh, hierarchical clustering function. From sklearn, I'm going to import a kilometer of clustering. Between those two, we will get the same analysis. And then I'm also going to transfer the data. So to create the difference distances, I do sch.linkage. And this is, it's kind of weird because we put in the method here. Um, but we end up with our uh, Euclidean distances here. To make the plot, the nice plot, um, I would actually say here, this is not just distance, this is like the whole shebang. Okay. Um, distance and clustering, sorry, right for To make the plot, I gotta do a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, but it ends up being a nice plot. I really like the coloring. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it doesn't um, map onto the clusters. So it might be con nice to think like cluster one, cluster two, and that is kind of how they break down, but cluster three is just this line by itself. It's not like, oh, and then I combine these two together. So um, the coloring is nice, but don't let you, don't think that that it means um, exactly how it maps onto the actual cluster. So we use matplotlib. This ag function works um, mostly for the server. Um, we add the title, the x label, the y labels, and then this dendogram is the function that actually plots. It makes the, the coordinates and stuff. Okay. So we can change all of these things. Leaf rotation is 90. That just makes it 90 degrees. Font size, that can make this bigger if it's not too easy to read. And then the labels, I grab those from R. So this in R, it automatically grabs the row labels, but here I have to tell it explicitly, here are the labels. All right, but look, it's the same plot, which is good. So these two methods are equivalent. To calculate the um, what group it should go in, so this is how I do uh, cut tree, basically, is I import some more stuff one of those is called f cluster that's kind of the important one and what we do here is we say okay here's the data the the saved cluster analysis here's the maximum number of dimensions which potentially is up to all of the leaves and the criterion here for building clusters we told it was max clust okay. um, now, our criteria might be silhouette distance is set, but we're going to do that manually here in a second. Okay. Uh, so max cluster is pretty much the normal one you put here, and then we'll calculate silhouette from that. Okay. So if I said, what's the maximum number of clusters that makes sense? Okay. It gives me an array back. So this is how I would, would add my classification label. So if I was trying to do this as, a, as an unsupervised classification, this is how I get the labels back out. And it picks like one, seven different clusters. And we've already kind of seen from our previous analyses that seven might be too many. So let's calculate silhouette distance. And you should get the exact same numbers. Okay, these two methods are equivalent. Okay. And that's not true every week, right? So we've, we've shown you some different analyses. And I'm like, well, the numbers are close, but they're not exactly the same. Um, in this case, they should be exactly the same. 
All right, so what we do is do silhouette score. Okay. So metrics dot silhouette. This was what I was talking about. Dots are problematic because that is a function and not. Um, I can't use dots in my data frame names. It freaks it out. It makes it angry. Um, so we put in the data. Notice this is the data, not the distance. Uh, we put in the um, F cluster function we just did with the distances or the analysis itself. I just put in two because that was the number we had looked at before. And then I told it, well, do, do Euclidean distances. And that's, we got the same number. To do all of them, now we do kind of um, a range of them. So we do range two up to, but not including maximum distance. So remember the slicing rules in Python. Oh wait, I haven't taught you guys slicing. That's the other class. We're gonna learn a thing right now. So in R, when we do two colon eight, we get two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we get two through eight. In Python, when you do that kind of range or what's called a slice, if you did two colon eight, you would get two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so it's the range function does two up to, but not including the last number. Okay, this is one of the big things that people have to like kind of um, have that moment. Every once in a while, I do it wrong and I'm like, damn it, up to, don't include. Okay, so this will be two up to, but not including nine. So this will give us up to eight. And so that's why the maximum dimension here is nine instead of eight, okay, because of the way Python works. And you just calculate it. So for each one, do this metric at the top. And we get roughly the same answer except for the last one. And I don't have a good reason why, because the silhouette distance here should be 0.02, something very small. Never figured out why, but in general, it gives me the same answer. So I would go through and think about picking two versus three. So why does R win here? Well, the plots are easier to make. And then I can also calculate this snake plot, which I could also do in Python, but it would be a lot more work. Um, and R has a built-in function for the validation, the bootstrapping. So I can do these equivalently across R and Python. And if, if you just want to know the best silhouette score and then apply that in an algorithm, Python is going to be faster computationally. Um, but if you're trying to really understand, like, what is it that's underlying these clusters so I can use that in my next analysis for boss man, um, R is going to give you the ability to do those snake plots kind of easily. So in summary, we've learned about semantic models and theories, okay. and we're going to keep working on those like models and theories for a lot many, many weeks now. So I've kind of and been introducing these ideas slowly and we're going to keep tweaking those ideas and working on how we can um, kind of decide if these make any sense. Okay. And specifically, we expect humans in the brain okay, to create these kind of clusters because we've already talked about categories and that, that's what a category is. It's a cluster of related things because that makes us easier to understand our world. And so this is sort of a weird foray into like what's going on in the world outside, but we uh, stereotyping um, is essentially categorical functions that our brain does because it helps us understand the world. And it takes a lot of work to overcome that, I think, as we have, can see, you know, going with everything going on. Okay. Um, usually we base this on features at the lowest level. We talked about how to turn cat completely categorical data into numeric data so we can cluster things together that are related. Then we learned about distance measures. That's going to be very important for the next several weeks. Uh, and then we talked about hierarchical clustering to help us create categories, create clusters that we can imagine as categories and um, visualize this kind of data. And some extensions. Um, so some analyses that we actually aren't going to cover, but we'll talk about as principal components, we'll cover factor analysis. And the multidimensional scaling is similarly popular to cluster analysis. It's essentially, I don't want to say it is cluster, it's cluster analysis in low D space, like one or two space instead of multiple space. 
Uh, and then the other popular method that I think a lot of analytics people are familiar with is k-means. And I don't have a real preference k-means over hierarchical. I kind of like hierarchical, but k-means works great too. It just works the other way. 